Howdy. Well, I'm back. Last week I uh, did a video recording of a presentation that David Chandler made at Portland Community College and uh, we'll be showing some selected clips from that today. But first, as I've started the habit, we'll show you some of the pictures I took this week. Just four days ago, got a fantastic sunrise from Rocky Butte. And you can see the uh, beautiful sky there, Mount St. Helens, and the 205 freeway comes curving in on the left side, and reflections of the clouds on the Columbia River over there on the right side. Let's look at the next one. and. Now yeah, there's a little better view. You can see Mount Rainier, that little bump to the left of Mount St. Helens. Absolutely beautiful. You know, if you don't get up in the morning and enjoy the sunsets, and so, I mean, sun, get up and enjoy the sunset. Yeah, okay. This, enjoy both ends, the sunset and sunrise. Uh, connect with nature. I mean, what are you living for? Just to get up the next day and go to work? Well, I mean, if you enjoy your work, it's not work. So... There's a nice one. Now, did you know you can see Mount Jefferson? I think we got one of those coming up pretty quick. You can see Mount Jefferson from the Columbia River, not just Rocky Butte. That, by the way, this is Camas, with, where the uh, steam is coming up there. It looks like smoke. Beautiful yellowness reflected in the water. Uh, there's your classic shot with uh, the Alpenglow sunrise on Mount St. Helens and one of the airplanes taking off from PDX. Sun's just beginning to come over the shoulder of Mount Hood. There's Mount Jefferson. You don't usually get to see it. It doesn't stand out very well. And this takes a telephoto. You'll, I'll stand back a little bit here, I think, in a second. I mean, now, I guess I don't have the far away shot. Now, that was it. And so the sun's just coming up. And that's where I stop because the sun gets a little higher and it... Uh, you know, it gives you lots of lens anomalies and whatnot. But you notice the sun lighting up the hills to the left of Mount Hood. And this, just uh, four short weeks ago, the, the sun was coming up what would be directly behind this uh, lamp. So it moves quite, quite rapidly north about this time. All right, well, we're going to now go to the first David Chandler clip. And uh, what... He started his, it was a two and a half hour lecture, and he started by talking about all the technical stuff and the actual, you know, hard evidence and so on. But one of the things that we don't do a lot in the 9-11 movement, uh, people associated with AE 9-11 Truth and so on, David Chandler used to be on their board of directors, uh, it, we, we try to stick to the evidence, and we don't do much speculation. Uh, obviously, that's the chink in our armor when we speculate about something then the debunkers come in and and discredit our speculation and by association everything else we had to say so we didn't speculate much but we're you know it's 13 years it's time to start telling people hey look this is why it's important so we're going to play some of these clips this uh first clip david chandler is addressing um, some of the more weird questions that get asked, you know, the debunkers start trying to inject things about oh, air pressure, the floor is coming down, and, you know, that's what blows stuff out sideways, and, you know, it's all basically scientific nonsense. You can show that it's not even possible, but they keep bringing it up, and they keep bringing it back, and they try to make us look crazy. We're going to go ahead and play this first clip, and I'll be back in just a few minutes. Sorry about that. What, what's going on now, we had a, a wireless mic on David Chandler, so his audio will be good. But nobody else had a mic, so the people in the background asking questions are How very do you low. have people jumping out go. windows without uh, equalizing the air pressure? I'm saying, once you blow out windows or open windows or whatever they did, they had lots of open windows because a lot of people came tumbling out. And once it started coming down on the sides, you saw all of this stuff blowing out the sides. So windows and a lot more were being blown out. So I think the difference in pressure that you're talking about isn't relevant 
to what's happening during the collapse of the building. Right. And they talk about if you basically have the building coming down like a piston, and some of these people are saying, well, how did it get to these focused little spots, you know, 30 or 50 feet, 30 or 50 floors lower? Oh, well, maybe through the air ducts. Well, uh, what kind of pressure does it take to blow out an air duct compared to what it takes to blow out one of those windows? You know, if you're going to have enough focused air pressure to blow out a window, it seems like that aluminum sheet metal stuff is going to be in splinters long before the window would reach breakable. Well, I do know that's a ridiculous idea. That's my point, is that... Okay. I'm saying people are proposing these as serious proposals. They are ridiculous ideas. They throw them out there, but they don't work. They're, they are not true, and you can show that they can't be true. So by the time you have blown out all of these windows down the side of the building, you have nothing to hold excess air pressure in place. So I don't think any argument based on air pressure in the buildings, whether it's from a piston effect or from this air conditioning effect or anything you describe, I don't think any of that can have anything really to do with what's going on. I think you can't avoid the fact we are seeing explosions. And I think that's concludable from what we're seeing here. So I'm not willing to just, oh, wave my hands. I think you have to distinguish between silly ideas and ideas that you can support. And I mean, I can, I'm not trying to say you're silly. I'm trying to say the people who are making these arguments and trying to make them stick. NIST made these arguments. You're quoting NIST. You're, maybe you're not quoting NIST, but NIST has done the same thing. And they certainly have the expertise to know that what they're saying doesn't make sense. Now, uh, I did a little bit different with this video. Up. There's also the full two and a half hours posted on YouTube on my channel, 251 Omega. And I did a little thing different. The first time I've ever done a playlist uh, type of thing, and if you click the little box for playlists, you'll find my Chandler videos on one playlist. But the idea behind those little short videos is that you can, you know, pick a topic. If you're arguing with somebody or you have an issue come up that you you can look through this little list and eventually I'll have it pretty complete and you just kind of select the one that matches the subject you're interested in. Uh, we're going to go into this the second half of what what we just saw was David Chandler got a little bit defensive there uh, rightfully so I mean we're attacked by these nutcase debunkers all the time uh, but anyway the guy in the audience was apparently sincere he wasn't one of these guys trying to discredit anybody he just wanted to know what the, what what everybody's talking about and uh, so uh, David Chandler goes you know he, he he gets through everything and then he actually steps back and kind of like a nice guy and actually explains why he said what he said and and so it gets on a human level and you can really connect with that so we're gonna go ahead and play it whole culture of denial of the stuff that we're talking about. Pseudo -skeptics. Pseudo skeptics. And the skeptic society is part of that. There's the JREF forum on the internet, which is part of that whole thing. There's that whole popular mechanics did a big major expose. There's National Geographic, who has done a couple of terrible exposes on television over various aspects of this, there's this whole effort to paint the 9-11 truth movement as a marginalized, non-credible um, response to 9-11. Sounds like Mike Michael Shermer. He's involved. He's one of them. Yes. There's a whole, there's a whole 
culture of people out there, excuse me, I'm not hearing you. What? Okay, that's fine. Um, I, I'm not trying to attack you. I'm, I'm, I'm basically, part of the emotion that came back out, I think, in my thing is, I've been attacked a lot, and I basically, hey, I have, somebody called a, my attention just yesterday. There's this guy named Alien Entity on the internet. Go look him up. He, I'm his pet project. He's out there to debunk everything I've ever done. He's been at it for several years, so he won't acknowledge who he is. But I mean, there's people out there who, uh, for whom uh, debunking this and making it seem crazy is their way of helping this not gain traction. I don't doubt that. Okay. Okay. I don't have any problem with that, and thank you. And I'm sorry. All right. I'm just trying to explain that. I, I feel like I sort of came on a little strong there. Okay. But what I'm responding to in the process of responding to your questions is. Where I've heard those exact arguments made was this whole realm of debunking, all right? And so that was what I really wanted to let you know is the, the debunking websites, uh, the JREF forum, the, the Skeptic Society, Popular Mechanics, all of those are, they have a major lack of credibility if you actually start looking at them critically. And so, yes, it's an interesting question, but then I think it has a straightforward answer, is that no, pressurization can't account for what we're seeing. That's my answer to it, anyway. And you can ponder that more, if you like, on your own. Is that okay for right now? I guess so, because it's a, I would ask why. Why what? Because once you have, once you had several waves of demolitions, did you see the one where I was talking about the lower wave had already come swept through all of this, and you still have all of these pinpoint ejections coming up above there? This lower wave had already come by there. It had opened up all of these floors. There's no closed compartments to pressurize. Once you open the windows, you have atmospheric pressure inside and out. Now there's going to be, as the floors come together, there's going to be an increase in pressure like that. And so that's why you get a puff of stuff and all that. But we're talking about focused ejections through floors that haven't collapsed yet. This floor is here, this floor is here, they stay there, and there's a thing that comes out in between. What's going to cause that? It's not going to be pressure in the air conditioning system. And it's not going to be generalized air pressure on that floor, which has already been opened up. It doesn't work as far as I can see. Okay, I, I guess that's as far as I need to go on that one right now. Okay, now that was real understandable. I mean, you know, once you open the window, it's atmospheric pressure on both sides. You don't have any force to blow anything any which way. And yet, there's explosions were still coming out, meaning some other explanation is responsible. Well, uh, this next clip is a real short one. It's under two minutes, but it's probably the most important one that you'll see. It, uh, I have never seen it before. In 13 years, I've never seen it. Now, I, that doesn't mean that it was hidden or anything. I just I don't know how I missed it, but this is the first time I've seen it, and it's Shocking, if you never saw it before. This is the distribution of human remains as discovered during the cleanup. 
little bitty millimeter sized pieces of bone found two or three blocks away from the building on top of buildings across the street and down the way. How does that happen if the building collapses? Everybody just be squashed in the building, in the footprint of the building, and they'd still be together. They might be flattened. How do they get turned into millimeter pieces and blown all over the place? It's an explosion. Play it. That building had a couple thousand people in it. It was coming down with people inside. So we're talking about something with um, visceral information here. I have a, here, just a second. I have to find it. <laughs> um, okay. That's the distribution of human remains. It's all over the map. If you had people crushed between floors of a falling building, you would have the human remains in the footprints of the building. But the human remains that were found on 9-11 are in the entire uh, field of where all of this, these clouds of debris were. They were blown out with everything else. <laughs> that one was so short. Set up the next video. Sorry about that. Quite professional here, aren't we? Well, if I had more than uh, 30 or 40 helpers, I'd be able to do this. Okay, um, this next one is basically another one of those things that architects and engineers usually didn't get into. This is the implications of controlled demolition. What does it mean that we've discovered explosives in the residue? What, what does it really mean? The implications of this being a demolition is that it was prepared. It took months of work to set it up for a demolition. The implication is the airplane collisions were a part of the cover story. That's actually part of the cover-up of what was really going on. So I'm not one who will say, no, those airplanes weren't really there. They were just holograms. You have all kinds of wild-eyed theories out there that I believe are planted in the media specifically to try to discredit this kind of inquiry. No, so yes, there were planes. Uh, whether there were hijackers on board has been questioned whether they were controlled by people or controlled like drones. I mean, you can actually fly a plane from outside the plane. And so uh, there is some evidence that they were, uh, they were brought in and they were targeted. It turns out that hitting those twin towers with these planes was a very difficult option. Um, you'd think that they're just sitting out there. But the planes weren't st sitting out there aiming at the building. If here's the South Tower, the plane that came at it was coming in this direction. It made two, only two maneuvers. It tilted its wings and made one direction change. And then in the last seconds, it made a slight correction and it went straight into the building. And there was crosswinds. And so it's not line of sight. So it seems very likely to me and to a lot of other people that these were being uh, computer guided. And it seems, in fact, that they were uh, predestined to hit known targets in the building, like the specific floors where, I mean, Kevin Ryan has done an analysis of who occupied which floors in the towers. And the companies that were occupying the floors that actually got hit by the planes are actually companies that should be on the suspects list. 
as being involved in this. And it seems that this whole thing has a lot to do with the military industrial complex, uh, security agencies, various, you know, who's who and who's NSA, who's CIA, who's the FBI, whatever. But I mean, and the military. The shadow government would be a, a sort of a name to put over it. That there is definitely, wh whoever it was who took the towers down had to have access to nanothermite, which was a military material. Okay, yeah, it kind of ended abruptly. He was going to go down the list a little bit more, uh, but due to editing constraints, I just quick quickied it out there for the show. Um, but uh, right now, we're going to go on to a little bit different aspect. You know, why is it that if, if all this stuff is so obvious to anybody trained in science, and even those with just high school levels of physics should be able to understand this and, and debunk the official story themselves. And by the way, uh, we will show you another clip where David Chandler gives you all the tools so you can make your own measurements and see if he's cheating. But in the meantime, this next clip that we're going to show uh, addresses the question, why is the media not jumping on the most important story of all times? Well, it's from our egocentric point of view, anyway. And, and what about the academics in the colleges? Why aren't they up in arms? So let's play this clip. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure they're not allowed to. I think they're intimidated out of it. Uh, I think that there is, or there's a very good video that's now available called 9-11 uh, in Academia or something like that. The academic community. 9-11 uh, in the academic community. It's an excellent video, and uh, I recommend you get a hold of it and if you, you have a copy. So see him and watch it. Because it's the same idea, how come the media doesn't cover this? Not only is Fox News not covering this, Amy Goodman, Rachel Maddow, uh, Bill Moyer, Bill Maher, John Stewart, none of these people, all of them poke fun at the 9-11 truth movement as though we're a bunch of crazies. And, and I'm saying that there is very heavy pressure at a certain level to go along with certain basic fundamentals that this country is not as corrupt as all of this implies. Not much. Okay. I came up to, all right, I'm, I live here in Portland now, but a few years ago before I moved up here, uh, I came up to a physics teachers conference in Portland. And I did a, uh, did a talk and I had a poster, a poster session, if you've been to these academic conferences. And so I had, by how many people took my flyer, I know about 100 people came by my poster and I had conversations on an ongoing basis throughout the evening with a lot of these guys. They'd come up and they typically would smirk and they would treat it as sort of a joke and I would point out and I said, did you realize Building 7 came down at absolute free fall? And they said, no, you know, no way. I said, well, here's my data, take a look. You go over there and start reading some of the stuff and then they would leave and they'd come back with their friends I mean, these guys, most of them had not heard of Building 7. And these are guys like, this is my peer group. So physics teachers at the high school and junior college and four-year college level, you know, the undergraduate type, that section through there makes up what's called the AAPT, American Association of Physics Teachers. And this group of people are, well, they have to be intelligent enough to understand and be able to teach physics. And they typically are fairly literate in day-to-day -day events of the world and so forth. They're intelligent people. 
And most of them hadn't heard of Building 7, uh, and those who had hadn't seen it, and they hadn't done any work on it. I mean, what I did was I actually, I put out a bit of effort to get together all the things I needed to make these measurements. Oh, I'm back. Yeah, well, um, he was just beginning to explain that he, you know, he realized that it's not easy for everybody to verify anybody's claims, you know, when you're talking about, is it in free fall or two thirds of free fall, two thirds of uh, acceleration due to gravity? How do we know that's true? Well, you can check it yourself. There's a, he's gonna show you his website and where all the tools are and where to get the videos and then you can do it yourself. And we're gonna show you that video later. But first, we're gonna go on more into some of the more technical questions like one of the things that the debunkers were always say was, look at that, it's exploding at the top and coming down. That's not controlled demolition. We know controlled demolition starts at the bottom. Every single time, there's never any, ever, no, no way, it's, that can't be controlled demolition because it started at the top. Yeah, there were two different types, two different types of construction, two different sizes of buildings. Um, it's my opinion, and I'll just add this in ahead of time, but you'll hear David Chandler give you several good explanations. But uh, I figured that the towers w were such an explosive event because they only really had access to the center core. You know, what they, they only had a few floors that were not occupied where they could actually reach the perimeter columns to do whatever they had to do. But they had access to the center cores. So they put in enough explosive to get rid of the center core, and then they quadrupled that to make it blast out far enough to get the outer core from the center core. That was my idea. I may, might be wrong with that, but let's listen to what David Chandler says. So, yeah? Yeah. And they're clearly demolished in separate ways. Do you have any theories on why the difference in demolition techniques with the two types of buildings? Well, I don't, okay, I don't see that as part of my agenda to try and explain every detail of I'm what, I, I, I'm, I'm going to answer it a little bit. I think that part of the reason they did it differently is that the towers were so tall that, uh, you know, you don't normally demolish things that are that tall because those are pretty exceptional buildings. And so they were able to take them down from the top down and make sure the whole thing demolished. They wanted to get rid of all of the, not only the buildings, but they wanted to get rid of all the evidence. They had it all fall in a small enough pile that they were able to scoop it up and melt it down and get rid of it. I think they were concerned that if you have too much of the bare bones stuff exposed to public scrutiny, it's going to show the mechanism of demolition. And the people who uh, cleaned up the site was a demolition company that uh, knew what to look for, you know. I'm sure they were out there scavenging everything that would be, um, you know, questionable. Well, I mean, again, it's speculation, but there are, if you go and read who was in Building 7, it was a lot of security type agencies, the Secret Service, the CIA, I, I might misquote some of these. Yeah, it's everybody imaginable. Yeah, the Enron investigation, the records from that was in there and so forth. So there's a lot of things uh, that there was a lot of things going on at a lot of levels. And so I'm not going to say this is why it happened, but it was clearly part of their agenda. Yeah, that's why there's so much of this, you know, it looks like co cooperation. They say it couldn't be a cover up because it involves everybody. How about if everybody's making millions? The entire indu uh, military industrial complex, it, this whole, the whole thing is designed to take all those bombs and weapons off of the shelves 
empty out the shelves so they have to be filled up again by the taxpayers. That is the entire purpose of it. The entire purpose. Just to blow things up so that we can spend more money. By the way, I came up with a great idea. We know that these uh, sociopaths are running these corporations and our government and that they're manipulating us to get us to go into wars as if those wars really had a purpose, uh, you know, some sort of decent humanitarian purpose, or kill people for humanitarian reasons, right? Uh, double speak. But the real purpose is to just sell more weapons. So why don't we shortcut that? We'll just make a little agreement with all those psychopaths. You get to stay completely rich, we'll just give you the money straight away. We'll just give it to you. You don't have to build the bombs and blow them up and play that game. Don't kill anybody, just take the money and go away. Everybody in the world will be better off. But that isn't going to happen. So now, this is the other part of the nanothermite discussion. He, David Chandler is going to discuss what is nanothermite, how is it working, and we'll take it from there. Well, apparently there was an excess amount because there were reactions going on. They literally uh, were pouring water on ground zero till, I mean, for months. This was September. The last fires were not out until after the first of the year. Now, how do you keep a fire? I've been around a house that burned down and you know, they'll be smoldering a little bit late in the day and maybe the next day, and then it's cool, right? So how do you have a building where these fires, weeks after the event, they're out there and their boots are still melting and all of this, and they describe it as like, like, here, I'm gonna... Mm. I'm not sure if this is the one. Okay. Here's the classic video on that issue. You recognize John Gross? Uh, 
who were trading their pocket by moving this wheel purely for life on the ground, they would not cause the cotton to blow up. But you know, these underground fires were just uh, the fires of hell. Six weeks. Now to follow up, okay, this is in the FEMA report, which was the first scientific investigation uh, fairly early on after the uh, disaster. And this is a piece of steel from Building 7, and you can see how it's like thinned down to be razor sharp, and it was definite sh signs of melting. There's even some discussion of vaporization. I mean, it's very, very anomalous to have something like that result in a building fire. And this was discussed in the FEMA report in Appendix C. However, the NIST report did not deal with that. Guess who this is? <laughs> and guess what this is? This is that, you can identify it from the little flex and everything involved. This is the same piece of steel that the FEMA investigation looked at and said had all of the signs of melting. And here he is, looks like he's just shot a, a buck, you know. <laughs> uh, anyway. Huh? Yeah, he's grandstanding. And it's, you know, this is back before the NIST investigation began. So he was part of that FEMA investigation too. He was the one to help select some of the what's going to be kept and what's going to be trashed. 
most of the steel from ground zero got cut up, sent off to China, and melted down. And there's only a few hundred pieces that have been cataloged and kept by NIST. Okay? And he was involved in that process and I guess, you know, minimized the incriminating evidence, I guess, but there he is. At that stage, he was thinking, oh, this is quite a good find. Uh, sort of comes back to haunt him. Okay, that was the, the first part of the nanothermite discussion, uh, dis discussing the extreme heat. That, that was the, you know, the, the trademark signature of thermite. Um, but the question came up, you know, how much thermite was involved, and they found 5 or 6 percent by weight in all the dust. And then they estimated how much dust there was, and they came up with a figure how much they reverse engineer the calculation. To, you know, you know how much iron is produced from how much thermite. You can work it backwards, and they decided that there was probably in excess of 100 tons of explosive that had to be installed. Now, that's an awful lot of explosive. How do you get that into the building past security? If you're dressed up like an Arab terrorist fresh off your airplane class or whatever it is, I mean, you don't. The only way you get in is if you have an inside pass. Somebody on the inside had to know that you were bringing in crap. You're going to cause trouble and they let you do it. Let's, let's ask David Chandler, how did they get hundreds of tons in? Uh, there was probably a mixture of techniques used in all the buildings. Uh, what she's talking about as far as nanothermite, thermite is, I'll, I'll just diverge over to thermite for a minute. Thermite is a material that's made of powdered iron oxide and raw aluminum, I mean elemental aluminum. And the iron and the aluminum, and then there's the oxygen attached to the iron, okay? Iron holds on to that oxygen, sort of. Aluminum has a much stronger attraction for the oxygen than the iron does. So if you heat up this mixture until the oxygen can get free from the iron, it just gloms on to the aluminum in a very intense reaction that liberates lots of energy in the form of high temperature. And they can use this, it's not normally thought of as an explosive, it's something that they used to use for welding railroad tracks, uh, the bombs they dropped on Dresden, all that, the fire bombing that they used in World War II, this thermite, they use it to demolish tanks, I mean there's all kinds of uses of thermite. But it's basically a very high temperature incendiary. Now, if you're going to use thermite in part of this demolition, what it would be doing would probably be some of the pre-weakening. It's a slower process than an explosion. It's not a high explosive, okay? But uh, they can use it for the pre-weakening, and then they probably had some kind of more conventional charges to, uh, you know, as far as time charges, to bring it all down at the final step. However, the thermite that they have discovered at, in the dust of the World Trade Center consists of thermite made of nanoparticles. So the, what a nanoparticle is, is a particle that's smaller than a micron, okay? So a, you know, a thousand times smaller than a, a micron is like, all right, like a red blood cell is like seven microns, I believe it is, all right? across. So we're talking about, huh? Yeah, <coughs> okay, so you go smaller than that. The particles that make up this nanothermite are a very uniform uh, consistency. The iron oxide that's in there is about, uh, I believe it's 100, 100 nanometers across, a tenth of a micron, and the flakes of aluminum that are in there are about, I think they said it was like 50 nanometers thick, little tiny flakes. And this is all embedded in a polymer that holds it all together. So it's very uniform mixture, 
that's bonded together into a manufactured material. It's stuff that's manufactured in the military labs. It's not available like at Lawrence Livermore and Sandia and places like this. It's not available on the open market. Okay? They found flakes, they, we, uh, Stephen Jones, who was quoted on that video you saw earlier. Stephen Jones and a number of others that are, uh, he's a physicist, and then Niels Heritz, a chemist from Denmark, and there's a bunch of these guys who collaborated. They studied this stuff for 18 months. They used electron microscopes. They used uh, all sorts of different ways of analyzing this. And it basically points to the fact that uh, they have flakes of unexploded nanothermite in the dust. When you take one of these flakes and you put it in a digital calorimeter and you raise the temperature, there comes a point where it triggers. And when it triggers, it goes off, it releases lots of energy very quickly. What you have in the ashes after you're done are microspheres of iron because the iron from the iron oxide is now turned into just plain iron. The oxygen is forming with aluminum to form aluminum oxide, which is like a white powder. And so you have these hot iron little microspheres that result, which means that when that little flake reacted, it produced temperatures hot enough to melt iron. So in other words, it's behaving like thermite. So these little tiny red chips, they show that, yes, it appears to have the consistency, has the composition of thermite, and it also behaves like thermite. And it's thermite made with nanoparticles. The reason they make it with tiny particles is it gives you a more reactive surface. So you can trigger it with a lower temperature and you get a very quick reaction. You can actually tailor it to act like an explosive. Okay, so it's not a high explosive like RDX or something, but it's, it can actually be used as an explosive. It can be used as rocket fuel. It can be used as an incendiary. Very, okay. So this stuff was found in large quantities in the dust. And the byproducts, which are these iron spheres, they had billions of these iron spheres in the dust. And so these are signs that this was present. Now, does that mean that was the thing they used to, to blow it up? It doesn't mean that. It means it was used. They also could have used more conventional explosives along with it. There was a question at the back, though. Um, no, hundreds of tons. Hundreds of tons. They've, the estimates that I have seen on how much of the nanothermite was involved based on, you take the iron spheres in the dust and you can compute how much material produced all of those iron spheres. These iron spheres are not molten steel. These are not from the structural steel. This is the iron that originated as part of the thermite itself. Okay? But from the chemical analysis of the spheres, it's pure iron, not steel. Okay? And so from the estimate of how much of that there was, the estimates that I have heard Niels Harriton others uh, make about this was that it's probably on the order of, I mean, there, it's a guesstimate, but on the order of 100 tons rather than, say, a ton or something like that. Now, there's a famous, for me it's famous, there's a quote when he was being interviewed by, a, uh, by the press, and they say, how do they sneak that in there, you know? Well, it's not under somebody's turban. You know, how do you get all that stuff into the Trade Center to uh, take it down? And his answer, very good answer, I thought, is on pallets. Okay? So, you basically imagine this. You get a guy with a workman's shirt on, a label on the back, says, Ace Elevator. They set out their cones. 
and they've shut down, you know, one elevator shaft at a time, and they're doing elevator repairs. Guess what? They were doing elevator repairs for nine months leading up to 9-11. All right? So these elevator repairmen would have access to all the core columns from the elevator shafts. And they could just wheel anything you want in there. They get passed through security. So if security was told to let these guys in, they can get in. You don't have to sneak it in. You just have to have somebody authorized to let you through. How about the perimeter columns? There were some of the perimeter columns where there's evidence of monkeying with them too. Uh, there's, lots, there's a lot of the floors that were not fully occupied. So there would be a lot of unoccupied territory they would have access to. And even if, you know, there's all kinds of rationales. Workmen are, are around these buildings all the time. But the, the major thing they had to do is take out the core. And the core they had access to through the elevators. Okay, that's pretty straightforward there. I, I want to say one thing real quick. Uh, apparently nanothermite is not just an incendiary. It doesn't just get hot and melt stuff. Uh, I mean, it, depending on how you build it. You can add different elements, different chemicals to it, like fluorine and other things like that, that during the reaction releases the gas fluorine or other, other with great volumes of gas very quickly expanding. That's the definition of an explosive. You can tailor these nanothermite devices to be the biggest bang for the buck. When you look at the advertising, which I have in the military industrial complex for their new nanothermite explosives, it has more explosive energy than RDX, C4, all that stuff. Uh, the most bang for the buck. Okay, well, before we run out of time, uh, we're gonna play this little part where uh, David Chandler explains how to get all the tools and videos so you can make your own measurements of Building 7 so you don't have to get involved in these arguments with the guys that give you ways that it could have collapsed and it could have knocked all these things out of the way and still look like it was not touching anything. You know, nonsense. Well, let's go on. Here's David Chandler telling you about speakout.org, 911speakout.org. 911speakout.org. This is my website. I just want to show you something here. Over here, see that? So it's physics lab. What I just recently did was, uh, here's a picture of building seven. I realized, this was literally very recent here. I said, in discussing my measurement of the free fall of building seven with one reluctant physics professor locally here, the professor at one point protested, I'll take your word for it, but for the sake of argument, but I have no way to confirm your claims for myself. I said it astounded me because it was such a straightforward measurement, right? But then I started realizing I actually was relying on collaboration with a number of key people to get together the videos, the data that I needed to calibrate the measurements, and all of these things, the software to do this with, I realized there is a fair amount of work that it would take for you to go out and reproduce my results. So, I put together a kit. Here's the lab instructions, like you could hand this, if you're a physics professor, you could hand this to a kid and say, here's your project. Here's the lab instructions, here's all the materials, uh, you can download it as a zip file here. And so if you're looking for a project, are you looking for a project? you're excited, <laughs> yes, you could basically go in and duplicate, you could do for yourself and make sure I didn't fudge, you can go through and measure the motion of Building 7. You can use those same tools on other videos to measure other things too. Once you get the skills, there's no stopping you, okay? You can do what I'm doing. And here's a little, I put together a little tutorial on using Tracker and all of it. So everything I use to put together these measurements, I put it together as a little lab. To, if you're interested, go for it. Do the measurements yourself or assign it to your students. Yes. Uh, okay, now 
I got to get right into this next one. Dr. Judy Wood is one of those disinfo mongers. She supposedly has a PhD in material science, but she doesn't talk anything like any scientist you ever heard of. And she's the one who talks about this nonsense about directed energy weapons, which aren't described. Some ray from outer space using Tesla's invisible energy field to power it. More power than all the generators on Earth put out in an instant. But it's possible, she says. She's a nutcase. And here's David Chandler's response to a question that sounded suspiciously like it was a Judy Woods uh, clacker. Well... I think there is plenty of rubble to account for the, what was in the buildings. I think that's a red herring. And I don't give Judy Wood any credibility whatsoever. So that's my answer to that whole issue. So hey, you, you, <laughs> you, you can't ask for more. Now, um, in the few minutes we have left before they play the credits, I just want to talk about how you can go look at this video. It's on YouTube right now. Before I even came to this show today, I did all the posting. So if you go to www.youtube.com forward slash user, U-S-E-R, forward slash 251 Omega, or just go to YouTube and type in 251 Omega, and you'll go to my channel and you'll see the David Chandler videos. If you then take the action to uh, click on the playlist, you'll find, I think the only playlist that's there for you guys to look at is the uh, David Chandler one that I just did. And of course, there is one other David Chandler video that we did last year, uh, or was it two years? Time flies when you're having fun. But when David Chandler first moved to Portland, he saw my show and came and we made a half hour video called uh, Har The Hard Evidence, three main irrefutable points of hard evidence and that's been very popular on both David Chandler's web and mine uh, wherever it's posted. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to continue editing little clips out of these out of this two and a half hour section. What we actually saw so far was maybe 40 minutes worth maybe a little bit less. So there's still you know real close to two hours about an hour and 45 minutes left of video that you haven't seen yet. Uh, by the way, that two and a half hour one is posted there with these short clips that I did. It's called Raw David Chandler because I I was going to go in and try to enhance this audio. It was it was a problem. I I thought that they had their own sound system and I'd be provided a patch, but I had uh, my wireless mic with me just in case, and so I gave that to David Chandler. But we didn't have mics for the people asking questions and. If you're in a quiet room, you can hear the question on this audio. But anyway, I'll see you next week with something new.